A bridge has collapsed in Baltimore, Maryland, causing a cargo ship a cargo ship hit it, causing people and cars to fall into the river below. That shocking footage of the moment the ship hit the bridge and it collapsed. Have a look at that now. That's the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore at 1.30 a.m. local time as a cargo ship collided with it. You're now looking at live pictures right now as a major search and rescue effort is underway. The Baltimore City Fire Department are calling this a developing mass casualty event. There are at least 20 people in the Patapsco River, but that number is expected to sadly grow. Vehicles and workers are understood to have fallen into the water from the bridge. This is one of the world's longest bridges. It's 2.6 kilometres long. Here's reaction from witnesses who were shocked as they were watching the bridge as it collapsed and they filmed that moment. Have a look. We're right next to the key bridge. Oh, what the f like, what the all f one people on the bridge just died, dude. Oh, my God. The key bridge sinking. The bridge is gone. Holy hell. It's just unbelievable to watch. It's understood the container ship is flagged in Singapore. Its official title is Dali. It was heading for Sri Lanka when it hit the bridge. At least 10 boats are now involved in the rescue. The fire department says the container ship hit a support column, which, as you can see in the footage, immediately caused the entire bridge to collapse on impact like a domino effect. It's understood that around 20 workers on the bridge also fell into the water. That, according to the fire department, the crew members and pilots who were on the ship, on the container ship, are at this point, it's said that they have been accounted for. There are no reports of injuries from those aboard the ship. Of course, that could change. This disaster only happened in the past three hours. More information is coming to light at every moment. Now, dawn is just breaking in Baltimore, Maryland. It's 5 a.m. local time. These pictures you're looking at now are just being taken. We've got live footage coming in. Uh, now, you can see these photographs are showing the bridge as it's sinking. If you're just tuning in, a container ship has hit a major bridge in Baltimore, Maryland, sparking its instant collapse. This has been described by local authorities as a developing mass casualty event. There's a major search and rescue effort underway. Uh, you can see in the footage, and I'm about to replay it in a moment, but if you look closely, you can see that there were vehicles, cars and trucks that were on the bridge as it went down. One was reportedly the size of a tractor trailer. So have a look closely. Here's that moment of its shocking and dramatic collapse again. And again, let's have a look at how those who were there watching the bridge as the cargo ship, the container ship hit it, as it collapsed, some of the witnesses managed to capture that moment on their phones. Here's how they reacted. Have a look. We're right next to the key bridge. Oh, what the f Like, what the all one people on the bridge just died, what dude. The no, oh, my up. God.
the key bridge sinking the bridge is gone holy hell it's said that about 11 and a half million people, commuters, pass on that bridge every single day. In a way, it's lucky that this took place at 1.30 in the morning where it managed to limit the number of people who were travelling across it and thus the number of casualties. The Baltimore Fire Department Communications Director, Kevin Cartwright, says that there are some cargo and retainers hanging from the bridge. He says this is creating an unsafe and unstable environment. It's complicating the rescue operation. He describes this as a dire emergency. We're going to bring you more news on this as it unfolds. All right, for some reaction, let's bring in now Sky News host Steve Price and former Speaker of the House Bronwyn Bishop. Welcome to you both. Steve, we've almost never seen pictures like this in recent times. I mean, it's, it's so shocking. You can't watch it enough times. The moment that container ship hits the bridge, hits that one support column, and the entire bridge, uh, you know, it, it, it's nearly uh, two and a half kilometres in length, but the whole main part of it just folds into the water. You can see all the vehicles, the cars on it, their headlights, and, and, and they just all sink on impact. Yeah, I think we're going to be very shocked in the morning when uh, dawn hits uh, in that part of the world and we, we see what uh, it's like when, when it's light. I mean, the death toll is obviously going to be a lot higher than what we imagine right now. I mean, it's the middle of the night. I think the world will be shocked when they see those pictures. I mean... It's not often you see an event like that unfold and you see the vision as stark as it was. It takes me back, I must say, to the only comparable event that took place here in Australia, which was back in 1975. It was, I think, the 5th of January 1975. Mm -hmm. The Tasman Bridge in Hobart, Shari, was hit by a bulk carrier, the Lake Illawarra. Twelve people died when that happened. Uh, Bromen will remember it well. There was... Uh, seven of the people were crew members on board that bulk carrier uh, and you saw pictures of cars back then hanging off the edge of that Tasman Bridge. It's mm. going, it, that disaster was nowhere near as bad as this but about the most comparable thing to ever have happened here in Australia. Mm. So, so, Bronwyn, that happened at 1.30am local time. Dawn is just breaking now in Baltimore. It's about 5am local time, just gone past 5am. We've been contacting uh, all the major news outlets over there uh, for updates. They're all scrambling to bring coverage uh, to viewers who are just waking up to this news. Um, Bronwyn, you know, when, when you came into the newsroom tonight, the first thing you said was you remember the bridge collapse in Tasmania, very similar to this, as Steve just said. Yes, indeed. And it does bring into the question the whole design of the bridge. Because in 1970, when they were building the Westgate Bridge in Melbourne, and you'll remember this, I think, Steve, a whole section of the middle of that bridge, when it was being built, just collapsed. Uh, 35 workers were killed um, because it was a design fault. Now, when I watched that footage and I saw that bridge tilt and go into the water, that looked very much like a design problem mm -hmm. to me. But I certainly remember the Tasman Bridge. It took two years to repair and $44 million it cost. Mm. Authorities now describing this as a developing mass casualty. Let's have a look again at the moment that the container ship hit that bridge and collapsed just three and a half hours ago. Here it is. I mean, Steve, you'd think that, you know, there's going to be a lot of questions now about why that container ship thought it was OK to pass under that bridge. What were the authorities doing? Why had no one stopped it in the lead up to the bridge? Um, you know, th these are the major questions that are going to be asked now, not to mention the, the design and, and other bridges around the world, you'd think, uh, will have to have some scrutiny as well.
I'm clearly no marine expert, I, but I presume there would have been a pilot on board that container ship. As you said, it is flagged out of Singapore. It was on its way to Sri Lanka. You'd imagine a pilot would have been guiding it out of the harbour mm -hmm. there in Baltimore and past that bridge. When you look at the vision, it's not as if it glances that pylon, Chari. It actually hits it head on. Mm. And the rest of that structure just completely collapses. You know, if it had perhaps glanced at maybe half the bridge would have come down, not the entire structure. I mean, obviously, there's going to be a massive inquiry here. And as I said, when sun comes up, I think we're going to be pretty shocked about what we see. But you just imagine what the, the stories are going to be that will come out of this yeah. on people who had either just driven over that bridge or were about to return over it or go to work on it this morning. If this had happened in peak hour in a city mm. the size of Baltimore, if mm. this had been at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m., mm. you just you cannot believe what the the fatality would, uh, rate would be. We're just I, I guess you know we're very lucky that it happened at the time it did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, yes. Rel relatively speaking, of course. But you know, as I said, the, the the let's have a look at those pictures again of of the live footage that we're seeing now coming out of Baltimore because it does look like um, it's very still there at the moment. You can see the bridge uh, coming out of the water. The you know there is a major rescue effort at, at the moment. But Bronwyn, you wouldn't have too much hope. The way those cars, the mm -hmm. truck. Uh, one of them, a major size of a trailer, how they just slid into the water. You can see it now. Um, you know, very hard to think that anyone who was in those vehicles would have made it out alive. I, I think very unlikely. And that, of course, was what happened in, in Tasmania. Those cars just fell into the water, into the river. Yeah. It, it's, it, it does shock you that in this day and age, <clears throat> with our engineering skills and ability, that this can still happen. And your point about, Steve, you made about where the hell was the pilot. I mean, navigating waterways like that, the pilots are so important in uh, controlling marine uh, movements. I think there are a lot of questions to be answered. Well, the main footage that we have been seeing, seeing that has been shared widely on social media and in news broadcasts appears to come from the maritime authorities. So they were watching this unfold. You wonder at what point they realised the container ship had breached the height requirements for the bridge and, you know, whether anyone had tried to ask the pilot to turn it round, whether it was just too late to turn around a ship of that size. Um, but, you know, the, the official footage does appear to have come from the maritime authorities. Uh, then we've seen the other incredible footage of the witnesses who just happened to be watching it unfold and had realised clearly that there was going to be an impact. That's why they started filming. Uh, let's bring in that footage again of the reaction from the witnesses who were watching it. We're right next to the key bridge. Oh, what the f like what the all f them the people on the bridge just died, what dude. No, oh shut my god. The key bridge sinking, the bridge is gone. Holy hell. They have said that the pilot and the others on board um, have all been accounted for. So at this point, no reports at all about anything other than a major catastrophic accident. All right, we're going to come back to this uh, later in the show when other news develops, when other footage comes in. For the minute, let's have a look at what unfolded today in Parliament. It's the last sitting week this week before a six-week break before the budget and the detainee crisis took centre stage once again. The Albanese government looking to rush through emergency legislation which would give the Commonwealth stronger powers to deport non-citizens, the detainees who are uncooperative from Australia. Uh, Bronwyn, the coalition says that they were only handed this legislation at 7.30 this morning. They were given a 20-minute briefing. Here's how Shadow Home Affairs and Cybersecurity Minister James Patterson described the process on Sky this morning.
Yet again, we've been called to an early morning briefing by the government who are in a panicked, rushed, patch-up job to fix problems in the immigration law. And what I'm gravely concerned about is that they expect, having given it to us on a Tuesday morning, for us and the parliament to pass it within 36 hours. So, Bronwyn, apart from the rushed process, what do you actually think of the legislation that the government has rushed through today? Well, there's been quite some consi considerable talk about whether or not it could, as an unintended consequence, actually encourage people smugglers. And the reason for that is, is that the proposed one-year to five-year imprisonment, um, if they won't go back, um, really could be saying, well, you can get here and if uh, you simply say you won't go back and won't cooperate, and you get a year in jail, or worse, five years in jail, that's worth it and then you can stay, mm. which is pretty alarming sort of message to be sending out on top of all the other signals that the government has been sending, sending out, which is why I suspect they've, they've been so obscure and obtuse that the word transparency should never pass mm. their lips. 100%. It, it, they are the most obtuse and obscure government I've seen. Everything is secrecy. Everything's covered up. And they didn't want it out there so it could be discussed. So mm. they, 7.30 in the morning, say, got to get it through today. Mm. I mean, the cynicism, mm. when it's such a chaos and, and we know that the minister uh, wants to have those refugees stay in the country. That's the problem. Steve, this is the second time the government has rushed through emergency legislation on the detainees. The problem is they didn't even use the first legislation that was rushed through late last year. What do you think of the laws they introduced today? And, again, do you think they're actually going to use them? Well, I keep asking for bipartisanship. What's bipartisan about, as Bronwyn said, dumping a piece of legislation on a desk at 7.30 this morning? We're told it was printed off last Friday afternoon, so it sat on the minister's desk. I mean, is Andrew Giles not the worst minister we've ever seen in this country? Clearly, he's getting close. Why would you not, uh, at the weekend, say to the opposition, here's the bill we want to pass, have a look at it over the weekend, and we'll chat, talk about it on Monday? They didn't even talk about it on Monday. It only came through today. And as we know, Parliament rises this week for six weeks until the budget. And so it doesn't seem to me that they're fair dinkum about any of this. And you've got to ask why, given that they had advice last year that they might lose that original High Court case, mm. they didn't have a bill like this ready to go back then. It makes mm. no sense. Well, if you go back to the original case where the 149 were let out, um, the real problem with that is, is that the government uh, agreed to the fact that they could not deport that person because nobody would take them. Mm. Now, if they'd not indeed done that, then the court may have decided another way. So it was the manner in which the government handled that first case and handled everything other since that in fact means that there's no real intent to keep those borders secure. We know that Albanese never wanted secure borders and Lippets don't change their spots. He can flap his lips all he likes, but what comes out is obscure, and misleading to all the people who are listening. So it's about time we've got some honesty coming out of the government. Say what your policy and intent really is mm. and then ask for people to support you. Yeah. Now, last night on this program, we reported that the University of Sydney had locked uh, pro-Palestinian activists in the same room as Israeli staff who were visiting from the Tel Aviv University. Uh, the University of Sydney says they're now investigating that incident. Uh, Steve, you know, this is just appalling that the University of Sydney has failed to deal with pro-Palestinian activism that is so extreme that it means that official work promoting university exchanges has been disrupted, but also that they would take the security risk of locking pro-Palestinian activists in the same room as senior Israeli officials from the Tel Aviv University. One of them is the vice president. Just beggars belief. I mean, it's a, yet another example of how it seems to be if you're pro-Palestinian protester, then you're going to be allowed to do whatever you want. Uh, if you are pro-Israeli, then there's a different set of rules. But 
to think that you were locked in the same room is just unbelievable. Now, the university is going to have an investigation. I mean, what are they investigating? It was their decision to do it. Uh, they should be condemned for it, and I'm sure they will be. And those people who've flown all the way here from Israel for this exchange, they're going to go back home, and again, they're going to have a discussion about how Australia doesn't appear to be concerned about the fate of Israelis who are trying to protect themselves. Yeah, all right. Steve Price, Bronner and Bishop, thank you both so much. Now, coming up, the Albanese government asleep at the wheel when it comes to our national security. Shadow Defence Minister Andrew Hastie will join me live. Plus, the Liberals prepare to take on the Teals in, the teals in Kuyong. I'll speak exclusively with the new candidate in Josh Frydenberg's old seat next. And we're going to keep bringing you live updates of the bridge collapse in Baltimore. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, to the major news tonight, if you're just tuning in, a major bridge has collapsed in Baltimore, Maryland, after a cargo container ship hit it. It hit one of its support columns. It has caused people and cars to fall into the river below. The Baltimore City Fire Department say it is a developing mass casualty event. There are at least 20 people believed to be in the Patapsco River. That number expected to grow. Vehicles and workers are understood to have fallen into the water from the bridge. It's 2.6 kilometres in length. A portion of it, a large portion of it, collapsed into the water. Here is the moment that it collapsed. Have a look. All right, we've now got live pictures coming in of the search and rescue effort. You can see the choppers there having a look for any cars, any vehicle, any people in the water. Dawn is just breaking in Baltimore. It's about 5.30 a.m. local time. The local news are now reporting that a major search and rescue effort is underway. Um, they are, they, look, 11, 11 million people travel across this bridge every day. This is a major disruption to daily life. It's a shocking bridge collapse. Questions over how that container ship was allowed to continue on its course. It was a Singaporean flagged ship headed for Sri Lanka. Let's bring in now Shadow Defence Minister Andrew Hastie. Andrew, this news breaking globally, uh, it's a, a major shock, a devastating event. Uh, your reaction? Good evening, Shari. Well, those images were just terrible to watch. And the first thing that came to mind is why, why is a container ship striking a bridge like that? Uh, that's the question that's in everyone's minds. And I just feel terrible for the, the family. So we're going to receive calls about loved ones lost in that incident. There's going to be a lot of people who've died. You've said 11 million people transit over that bridge every day, even though it was only at 1.30 in the morning. I'm sure we can expect uh, a lot of casualties. Yeah. We'll keep bringing live news on that as it comes through. Now, Andrew, today the Albanese government rushed through legislation to Parliament that would give it the powers to put non-citizens behind bars if they refuse to cooperate with deportation. Uh, this legislation, despite the process, you only found out, the Coalition only found out about it at 7.30 this morning, but is it a good response to the High Court's decision that uh, no one can be indefinitely detained? Well, Sherry, we'll wait and see. And right now, there's a Senate inquiry ongoing into the bill. Uh, Senators Michaela Cash and James Patterson are interrogating the bill, asking questions of departmental fish officials. It's important that we understand it before we vote on it. So that's the process at hand. But it has been rushed. It was very rushed. At uh, 7.30 this morning, the, the senior shadows were called in by the government to be briefed on the bill. They had 20 minutes. And then the government attempted to ram it through the House, which they did. Uh, we had the opportunity to speak on it with the crossbench. But certainly, there's a lack of transparency here. This is rushed. And I think at the heart of all this is a lack of leadership. In fact, it's bad leadership. The Minister for Immigration, Andrew Giles, has shown incompetence now for the last six months. 
He's unable to impose himself on the situation. And once again, he's passing legislation in a hurried fashion because he can't lead and govern in a prudential way with regards to our borders. Mm. Look, just for another big story globally at the moment, Chinese state hackers have been identified and have been blamed for a serious cyber attack in the UK. Also another one in New Zealand Parliament. Uh, in the UK, it was an attack on the electoral roll. 40 million voters said to be uh, potentially affected. Meanwhile, in the Australian government, we've got a very different approach to China at the moment. The UK clearly calling out China. Uh, Australia seems to be very barely mentioning Albanese and Penny Wong, barely mention in public any uh, of Chinese aggression, interference um, in our democratic systems. It, it's a very different approach to the coalition government. Uh, which do you think is the right one? I think it's important for your viewers to understand the significance of this. The US Electoral Commission, with the data of 40 million voters, was uh, attacked by uh, advanced persistent threat 40, or I think it was 31 actually, which is um, works for the Chinese Ministry Security of State. And um, this is very significant. Um, also, MPs were surveilled using cyber means. Um, and what have we done about it? Well, we haven't joined with the New Zealand government in making attribution to uh, the Chinese like uh, Prime Minister Christopher Luxon did today, uh, where they went through the details of a 2021 cyber attack on the New Zealand parliamentary services. Um, so, just last week, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi, the Chinese Foreign Minister, was here in Canberra meeting with the government. We also had Lord Cameron, the UK Foreign Secretary, here in Canberra. And you'd think after having such a close relationship with the UK, being an AUKUS partner with the UK, that we would have joined with the US and New Zealand in condemning these uh, cyber attacks by China, but we haven't. And mm. I think that is um, very concerning, and that's for the government to explain while I've, while why they have stepped away when other partners have stepped towards the UK during this, this time. Mm -hmm. All right. Andrew Hastie, thank you so much for your time on this sitting week in Canberra. Really appreciate it. Now, the question everyone has been asking is whether Josh Frydenberg was going to run again for the next federal election. Well, on the weekend, we found out our answer. At this point for this election, he isn't. And the Liberals pre-selected their new candidate, Amelia Hammer. Amelia comes from a long line of Liberal royalty. She's the grandniece of former Victorian Premier Sir Rupert Hammer. She's the granddaughter of Liberal Senator David Hammer. And Amelia joins me now for her first television interview, her ex this exclusive interview since her pre-selection on the weekend. Firstly, congratulations, Amelia, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Shari. It's great to be here, and I'm incredibly humbled to have been chosen by the Liberal Party in Kuyong. Now, Josh Frydenberg was obviously a very strong candidate. He was treasurer, and yet he lost his seat to a teal to Monique Ryan. Uh, do you think you can win Kuyong back? Absolutely, Shari, because what we're hearing from people is, you know, they want to be listened to. I'm hoping to listen to the people of Kuyong, and particularly, I'm hoping to provide a voice for younger Australians. So I'm in my 30s. We don't have a lot of politicians, and we don't have a lot of politicians in the Liberal Party who are, uh, who are my age. Uh, and what I want to do is, you know, people in, the, in their 20s and people in their 30s in Kuyong and, you know, in, around Australia are sort of feeling like they're getting a bit of a raw deal. Uh, and I want to be able to listen to those people and advocate, them, advocate for them on issues that are important to them. Well, speaking to Josh Frydenberg uh, in the past, his view was that Koo Young um, has changed demographic. It has become more of a progressive, left-leaning seat. Uh, do you agree with this characterisation of the seat? And, and then, if so, what does that mean for your strategy against the Teals? What sort of issues do you think you need to highlight? I don't think, you know, there are certainly a lot of young people uh, in the seat of Kuyong. Kuyong has the largest population of 18 to 25-year-old electors in the state. Uh, I wouldn't equate young people with, with left-leaning necessarily. I think it's about us taking our values, which, you know, the liberal values and the liberal lens, which is, which is timeless. Things like reward for effort, competitive enterprise, freedom. That resonates just as much, and if not more, with young people than as it does with older generations. Uh, and what I want to do is be able to say to people, hey, look, you agree with our values, so you should be voting for us. 
Mm. What's your critique of how Monique Ryan has been going since she entered Canberra? Oh, sorry. I, 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 you know, I think, you know, the tone of politics matters and it, it matters to people in Kuyong. And that's one of the things that really came out of the last election, which is that it's important in terms of how we how we speak about each other. So, you know, I have the utmost respect for Monique Ryan, but we disagree on, an, on, on a number of issues, uh, primarily the fact that, you know, I can bring a liberal lens and a liberal philosophy uh, mm. to uh, the issues that are important to the people mm. of Kuyong. Just before we go, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Have you always wanted to get into politics? Uh, what's your profession? You know, what's your background? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I, you know, I've always had an interest in politics. I joined the Liberal Party when I was just 17 years old. Uh, you know, I, I, I studied overseas. I was very lucky to be able to do that. I worked on the trading floor uh, in a big investment bank in London. I was the, there the day that uh, Brexit happened, the day that Theresa May almost lost the unlosable 2017 election to Jeremy Corbyn, the day that Trump was elected. Uh, and then I worked in venture capital uh, across between London and, and San Francisco. So, um, and follow, following that, I, I, I ran a, the Australian business for a technology company uh, here in Melbourne. So, you know, I've got a wide range of professional experience that I hope to, to bring to the do job and hope to bring in future if I'm, you know, if, if the people of Kuyong put their trust in me to the Liberal Party room. Yeah, well, an overachiever, if nothing else. Amelia Hammer, thank you very much for joining us and best of luck knocking off Minnie Ryan. I mean, Amelia wants to be uh, very polite, but we aren't about the deals on this network or this program. Now, coming up just one day after the ABC chairman's promise to crack down on impartiality, shocking internal emails and comments from ABC staff on pro-Israel bias. That's coming up. Plus, we're going to have more on the major bridge collapse unfolding right now in the United States. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, we are learning just this evening that ABC journalists have complained to their management that Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails deserve equal treatment to Israeli hostages captured by Hamas. The ABC staff also complained about using words like massacre and terrorism when describing the October 7 attacks. But then they complained that they weren't allowed to use aggressive language when reporting on Israel's actions in response. These shocking demands are from ABC staff, including journalists, who are meant to be impartial. We know they're not impartial, and this document that I'm about to show you dismantles any notion that the ABC can claim to be objective when it's reporting on Israel's war against Hamas. This three-page document was obtained by Al Jazeera, of all places, under Freedom of Information. And it details many of the complaints from ABC staff about their coverage of the war. The journalists complained they weren't allowed to use words like war crimes, genocide, ethnic cleansing, apartheid and occupation to describe Israel's actions in Gaza and the West Bank. But here's what they say, and I quote... Meanwhile, we're quick to use terrorist, barbaric, savage and massacre when describing the October 7th attacks. They also said we are far more comfortable in labelling Hamas's actions terrorism, yet lack the language to correctly describe Israeli aggression in the region. I mean, it's unfathomable that there are actually ABC staff complaining that they're quick to use terrorist and massacre when describing October 7th. I mean, someone needs to tell these ABC journalists that the use of words like genocide and apartheid would be inaccurate when applied to Israel. ABC staff complained to management that, and I quote, we mention the number of Israeli hostages in many stories, but we never mention the number of Palestinian prisoners in Israel. Well, that's because you cannot compare the two. The hostages... Innocent men, women, children and babies captured by Hamas, whereas the Palestinians who are in prison in Israel are terrorists. They're criminals. It's unbelievable. This is what ABC journalists and staff think. Well, joining me now is Spiked Chief Political Writer Brendan O'Neill. Brendan, thank you so much from, 
for your time tonight. Look, this is coming from the ABC taxpayer funded to the tune of a billion dollars a year. Should we be surprised that uh, this is how some of their journalists want their coverage on the war to unfold? We shouldn't be surprised, but we should be shocked. It is outrageous and actually quite disgusting that there are people at the ABC who think there is a moral equivalence between Israel and Hamas and who want to use similar language to describe both sides. That's like saying there's moral equivalence between a fascist movement and the victims of that fascist movement. That is essentially what these people are saying. And they pose as if they're challenging uh, the ABC's pro-Israel bias. As we know, the ABC doesn't have a pro-Israel bias. It has an anti-Israel bias. But they pose as, as challenging bias. But in fact, they want to bring more bias to the ABC. They want to bring their bourgeois bigotries into work. They want to bring their, uh, uh, their hatred for Israel, their Israelophobia, into the workplace. They want to use words like genocide, ethnic cleansing, apartheid state, these very inaccurate, fact-free, bigoted terms that are used against the Jewish state and the Jewish state only. So what these people are actually demanding is the right to spread their Israelophobia on the publicly funded broadcaster. Mm. This is a very serious state of affairs, and I think it really speaks to a moral rot at the heart of the media elite. Mm -mm. Well said. You are so articulate, and that is absolutely accurate. Now, we've seen just overnight that Israel has cancelled its plans for senior officials to visit Washington. This after the United States abstained on the UN Security Council vote that called for a ceasefire in Gaza. Look, this is clearly tensions escalating between Netanyahu and Biden, but to me, it seems like the United States is walking away from Israel when it claimed that it was going to support its stated aim of eradicating Hamas. Biden's America is stabbing Israel in the back. I'm really shocked by their abstention on this uh, motion at the United Nations, which doesn't make a ceasefire conditional on the release of the hostages. Let's not forget that there are still many Israeli hostages in Hamas and Islamic Jihad captivity, including American citizens. I think there are six American citizens. And Biden's America seems not to take that very seriously. And they're sending a really powerful message to Hamas. What the White House is essentially saying to Hamas is you can carry on terrorizing. You can carry on holding these hostages, which is a crime against humanity, because we are going to put pressure on Israel to stop bombing you, to stop bombing Hamas. So this doesn't only weaken the relationship between the White House and Israel at a really important moment, which I think is an act of betrayal, mm -hmm. but it also emboldens Hamas. It sends them a really important signal that even now, the, the most powerful country in the world, the most influential country in the Middle East, is going to put pressure on Israel to uh, down weapons and let Hamas essentially carry on holding these hostages. I, I think what Biden is doing it is he is sacrificing Israel because he's worried about certain Democratic voters turning against him. These are mostly upper middle class graduates, the elected sections of the Democratic Party who have a real burning hatred of Israel. He's sacrificing Israel to win the votes of that section of society. I think it is such a political mistake. It's a moral mistake. And I think it's a really shameful thing that America is doing. Mm -hmm. It is devastating. Um, just before you go, we're hearing that far-right commentator Candace Owens has quit The Daily Wire. Uh, it's a conservative uh, news website. Reportedly over anti-Semitic comments that she has made, that she's part of this kind of... Um, isolationist movement in the Republican Party that's been arguing against the US involvement in Israel, uh, or in support of Israel, also Ukraine as well. Uh, what's happened here? I think sections of the right are going a bit mad. I must say, you know, the kind of very online right, the right as represented by people like Candice Owens and some of her followers, you know, we know that the left has gone completely insane since the 7th of October. Well, more insane, more insane than they already were. They've been on the streets holding what are essentially pro-Hamas marches. They've been mm. damning Israel, the most evil state in the world. 
They've been flirting with ideas of barbarism and turning their back on civilization. We know that that's what the woke left has done. But I think sections of the online right are starting to do something very similar. And Candice Owens really sums this up. She has she started off by attacking Israel, but it morphed very quickly into attacks on Jewish people. She's now saying that the Jews run Washington, D.C., and they are doing horrific things. And these gangs of people are, uh, have a stranglehold over public life. These are old anti-Semitic ideas, I'm afraid to say. And it re she really does demonstrate that anti-Zionism is a gateway drug to anti-Semitism. And very quickly, hatred for Israel can become hatred for the Jewish people. And I think it's very worrying that we're seeing that across the political spectrum at the moment. Yeah, and at times... Uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are indistinguishable. Brendan O'Neill, thank you so much for your clear thinking and your writing. We love your work here in Australia. Thank you for joining us. Now, after the break, Donald Trump was granted a last-minute reprieve, saving his New York towers and golf course from being seized. Plus, we'll have more on the major bridge collapse in the US. Jenna Clark and Kayla Bond will join me next. <laughs> Well, if you're just tuning in, a major bridge has collapsed in Baltimore after a container ship hit it, causing people and cars to fall into the river below. This is the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, 1.30 a.m. local time, as a cargo ship collided with its support column and it collapsed. There are said to be at least 20 people in the Patapsco River. That number expected to grow. Here's just one report from on the ground in Baltimore. So I'm going to move to the side here a little bit so that you can see what's behind me. And as photographer Tristan Webster is able to zoom in, you can see what's left on this side of the key bridge. You can sort of see how the roadway ramps up. Now, we have no idea how many people were actually in the water and how many cars were traveling on the key bridge at the time of the collapse. Right, the Australian's associate editor Jenna Clark and Sky News host Caleb Bond join me now. Jenna, this is major global news tonight, a bridge collapsing, and we saw before our very eyes witnesses captured the moment that cars fell into the river below it. Absolutely horrifying, Sherry, and I guess it is just coming up to 6am local time in Baltimore now. As that reporter just showed, it would be absolutely freezing, not only standing and reporting on it, but in the water. So hearts and, hearts and minds go out to all the victims involved. This is just horrifying. Caleb, your reaction to seeing that shocking and confronting footage? Well, I mean, horrifying, I think, as Jenna said, is, is probably the only word you can use in this circumstance. But the question will now turn to how this happened. I mean, a, a cargo ship uh, on average is moving at somewhere between 15, 20 knots, which isn't all that fast. So they should have been able to see that coming. It looked as though the ship hit the bridge head on. How they didn't do something about that, I don't know, and I suppose that's the question that a lot of people will be asking now. Mm. Mm. Onlookers could obviously see that the container ship was about to collide with the bridge because mm. they started filming as the bridge went down, and, and we've shared that footage on the program tonight, mm. that horrifying moment that it hit. Um, now, let's have a look at Donald Trump at the moment. We've seen that he's had this 11th hour bid uh, to have his nearly half a billion dollar bond um, look, let's have a, a look at what he had to say today. Right, we'll bring you those comments uh, next time. Jenna, New York Attorney General Letitia James uh, clearly must be devastated when she realised she wouldn't be seizing any of Trump's assets, <laughs> at least not in the near future. <laughs> yeah, down to, I think they slashed it down to, what, 175 million Australian dollars? That kind of makes me feel better for uh, the fact that it's coming up to payday. But it is interesting and I think a lot of commentators have said, and, and I know that the Australian's Adam Crichton writes uh, this evening, that this is only just going to add fuel to Donald Trump's president presidential campaign. His supporters will just be more fired up to support him. And look, if I think I were the, the secretary or the treasurer of the RNC, considering his daughter-in-law, Lara Trump, is now the president, I would be watching where those pennies uh, to go very closely in the lead up to, to November. All right, we have those comments now. Let's play them for you now. I greatly respect the decision of the appellate division and I'll post either $175 billion in cash or bonds or security or whatever is necessary uh, very quickly within the 10 days. And I thank the appellate division for acting quickly 
But Judge Andorra is a disgrace to this country, and this should not be allowed to happen. I mean, Caleb, 175 million. Look, it's a lot less than half a billion, and that's US dollars, by the way. But, you know, many people would be thinking this is entirely political to begin with, and mm. Trump shouldn't have to pay even that. Oh, it's just absurd. Look, he says he's going to post it in cash. Part of me hopes he posts it in <laughs> pennies just to uh, <laughs> cause as much grief as he possibly can. But the whole thing is absurd. I mean, we're talking about a case here where no harm was done to anyone. The banks that he allegedly defrauded actually spoke uh, in his favour in this court case, and he still has to stump up 175 million dollars. It is absurd. And as Jenna said, it just helps Trump. It boosts his, his base. They love this stuff. Mm. Yeah, it does, Jenna. And, you know, coming up to the November election, a lot of people will be looking at the four criminal cases, the two civil cases against the president, and it will work in his favour. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the fact that the Democrats, the only thing, the only thing that they have to come back is, is like re responding to some things that the former president's posting on his uh, truth media social platform about how we won a golf tournament. They are just completely bereft of any... I mean, this race is just going to be an absolute abomination. I mean, just watching those comments there, it is just an absolute farce what is going on in the judicial system and also the political system in, in America. Yeah. All right. Final word, Caleb. It's entertainment and Trump provides it in spades. I have the popcorn ready for the next few months. <laughs> well, we need more than entertainment from the US president, but the rate Biden is going, particularly with his support evaporating for Israel, maybe we could do with a change. Jenna Clark, Kayla Bond, great to see you as always. That's it from me, and here's Paul Murray.